Jesus, what a friend for sinners, Jesus, lover of my soul. Welcome to the Unknown Bible, the broadcast ministry of Bible Believers Baptist Church in Corpus Christi, Texas. Join us now for today's Bible study with our pastor, Bevins Welder. This lesson is a refutation of Calvinism as supposedly found in Romans chapter 9. When you read Romans chapter 9, and we're going to discuss most of the chapter today, you get to verse 11, and verse 11 speaks of the purpose of God according to election. The purpose of God according to election. Unconditional election is one of the five points of Calvinism. Calvinism is a doctrine that teaches among other things, that God chose from the foundation of the world who would be saved and who would be damned. Those he chose to save are called the elect, and their election is unconditional. That is, uh, they don't have anything to do with uh, making the choice. God made the choice. Unconditional election, as taught in Calvinism, is a false doctrine. And you're going to see that in this lesson today. Now, always remember something, because we're going to be studying Romans chapter 9 today, mainly. When studying a chapter that seems to teach something contrary to the rest of the New Testament, be careful in handling the passage. And that's the case with Romans 9. Something about Romans 9 is peculiar, and we're going to look at that today. God's election in Romans 9 11, where he says, the purpose of God according to election, that, that mention there of election is this, that God would fulfill his promise to Abraham through Abraham's literal seed. God's choices for the fulfillment of his promises through Abraham's seed were Abraham. Look in Romans 9, 7. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they the, all children. So Abraham is the beginning. Uh, the next choice is Isaac. Again, look in Romans 9, 7. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. The next one is Jacob. Romans 9, 13. As it is written... Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And then, finally, Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 9, verse 5. Speaking of uh, Israelites, whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Look in Romans chapter 9, and verse 33. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So that's the line of the Jews through whom God would fulfill his purpose. Again, the line of the Jews through whom God would fulfill his purpose is Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then down to Jesus that are mentioned in this chapter. Uh, the, and you know then, when you understand that, that the purpose of God according to election was not through Ishmael and his descendants, and it was not through Esau and his descendants. That's obvious in this passage, and it's obvious all through the Old Testament. Now, still addressing God's purpose according to election as it concerns Israel, as it concerns Israel, Look at Romans 9.27. Isaiah also crieth, he's speaking about Isaiah, concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, watch it, a remnant shall be saved. Now, you know what that shows you? That shows you that there will be enough Jews left at the end of the tribulation to fulfill 
the promises that God made to Abraham. Look in Romans 9, verses 7 and 8. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. And that's because Abraham had other children, Ishmael being one of them. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. The purpose of God according to election is going to stand because Israel will be saved. Israel will be saved. Um, look in Romans chapter uh, look at Romans chapter 11 verses 25, 26 and 27. Paul is writing and he says, I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. That hadn't happened yet. And so, verse 26, all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Sion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. God's going to save Israel. That's his election. And there will be a remnant left in Romans 9, 27 at the end of the tribulation so that God can fulfill the promise that he made or the purpose of God. Israel will become the ruling nation of the world. If you read Isaiah chapter 60, for instance, and there are other places where you can read this. If you read Isaiah chapter 60, for instance, uh, you know, Israel, believe it or not, comes out on top and all the Gentile nations end up serving them. Isaiah 60 verse 10, the sons of strangers, that's Gentiles, shall build up thy walls and their king shall minister unto thee. For in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favor have I had mercy on thee. Therefore thy gates shall be opened continually. They shall not be shut day nor night, that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles, and that their kings may be brought. For the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish, yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. So Israel is saved. Israel becomes the ruling nation of the world. And Jesus is going to be the king. He's going to be the king of Israel. And he's going to be the king of the world. And he's going to be sitting on the throne of David. Revelation chapter 11. As you go through um, those various seals and, and trumpets and vials and so forth. You get here to Romans chapter 11 and verse 15. The seventh angel sounds. That's on the trumpets. And there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That's God's choice. That's God's purpose according to election, that Jesus Christ will be the king of the world, and he's going to rule from Jerusalem, sitting on the throne of David. You read that in the prophecy concerning his birth. The angel says to Mary, Thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, shall be called the Son of the Highest. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. World ruler. And the new covenant that God promised to Israel in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 37, is going to be fulfilled. Among other things, he said, They shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. And what does he do? He forgives their iniquities. He forgives their sins. And he remembers them no more. Now God made all those decisions that Israel is going to be the ruling nation of the world, that, that, Jesus, that Israel would be saved, that Jesus would be the king, that he'd rule on the throne of David, that uh, the new covenant would be fulfilled. He made all that decision long before he ever thought about you and me. And he fulfills that purpose according to election through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jesus Christ, and then those who will trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. Nothing any man can do, anything man can do down here, nothing's going to change that. The purpose is fixed for Israel. Nobody can change that. I don't care if, if uh, uh, Iran or, or North Korea or anybody comes up or Russia or anybody comes up. I mean, 
not to say that any of them would, but you've heard talk about those kinds of things, come up with some sort of a nuclear weapon to destroy them all, it isn't going to happen. The purpose is fixed. All of this happens because the purpose of God according to election stands in spite of the fact that many individual Jews have rejected Jesus Christ. Look again in Romans chapter 9 and look at verses 32 and 33 again. Verse 31 for the context, Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now, it was these Jews, these ones who stumbled, these that hit the stumbling stone, the rock of offense, the who were not seeking Christ by faith or were not seeking the promise by faith. It was for these Jews that Paul was so burdened he could wish himself to be accursed. Look at the beginning of Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. Paul says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises. Paul said, I could wish myself accursed for these men. And may I tell you something? The, their rejection will not keep the promises of God from being fulfilled. When they crucified Jesus Christ on the cross, they did not keep the promises of God from being fulfilled. Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 29, really have nothing to do with individual salvation. Romans 9, verses 1 through 29, has nothing to do with individual salvation. This passage concerns Israel as a nation of descendants from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The nation, Israel, is made up of lots of individuals. As Romans 9, 27 says, The number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea. And of all these individuals, only a remnant, according to Romans 9, 27, shall be saved. Hence, listen, they were not individually elected, even as we are not individually elected. You see, ever since the cross of Christ, any man that wants to get in on salvation and the mercy of God must have faith in Jesus Christ. That's Romans 9, 30 to 33. Look at verse 30. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. Faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in the stumbling zone. Faith in the rock of offense. Faith in Jesus Christ. That's how you get saved. Now look, whether a person is a Jew or a Gentile, when he puts his faith in Jesus Christ, he saved. Romans 9, 24, speaking of us, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. In Acts chapter 15, big discussion went on about Gentile salvation, and Peter is comparing what happened to the Jews earlier to what happened to the G Gentiles when Cornelius and his household got saved. And he says this in Acts chapter 15, verse 11, We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we, speaking of Jews, shall be saved, even as they, speaking of Gentiles. If a person will put his faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on Calvary, then he becomes a child of God. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. 
And then he says in Romans 10, 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If he puts his faith in the finished work of Christ on Calvary, then he becomes a child of God. Romans chapter 9, verse 8. They which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. At the, per, at the point that a person puts his faith in Jesus Christ, God extends to him the benefits of the promises that were made to Abraham in Romans 4. And those promises include eternal life. You know, that's why Paul was willing to be accursed for his brethren, his kinmen, in Romans 9, verses 1 through 4. He knew that they were passing up what God had promised to Abraham by election. You can read about that in Galatians chapter 3, particularly verses 14 through 29. I'm not going to read that now. It's a long passage of Scripture, but you can read that for yourself. Paul knew that those individual Jews were passing up what God had promised Abraham by election found in Galatians chapter 3, because, listen, they were rejecting Jesus Christ. Now think about this. If God had already elected some of the individual Jews and had already condemned the rest of the individual Jews, then why in the world would Paul want to be accursed for them? If election is predestination to individual salvation, Paul couldn't have changed a thing by being a curse for them. His curse would have been utterly foolish. Did you hear what I said? If election is predestination to individual salvation, Paul could not have changed a thing by being cursed for his kinsmen. Absolutely foolish. You get that, don't you? You do. Election is not predestination to individual salvation. Now, looking back, through some of the things that you see in the Bible, we know that salvation is of the Jews. John 4, 22. That's what Jesus Christ told the woman at the well. And we know that Jesus came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew chapter 15, verse 24. That's what he told the Syrophoenician woman. Not come, but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Yet, many of these literal descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you know what? They went to hell. Matthew chapter 23, verse 33, Jesus Christ is giving those Jewish Pharisees uh, a scathing. And uh, he says to them in Matthew 23, 33, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Uh, well, there's a rich ruler that comes to the Lord Jesus Christ and he wants to be saved. Uh, when Jesus Christ tells him what he needs to do, the guy turns around and walks off. Uh, the, the rich guy that uh, won't take care of Lazarus, who's at his gate, he winds up in hell. He's a Jew. Now, why did these individual Jews wind up in hell? That's because they neglected, listen, they neglected the salvation that was offered to them in Jesus Christ. Um, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? You can't. And that's the fate of every man who rejects Jesus Christ as his Savior. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved. And if you reject, reject the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are condemned. Uh, John 3.18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You see that? It's all based on belief. Now, these people, the, the Pharisees, the, the rich man who wouldn't feed Lazarus, the rich young ruler, they didn't wind up in hell because God predestinated them to go there. That would have been completely contrary to his stated will. God's stated will concerning repentance and salvation is found in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some meant count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 
<laughs> unconditional election as taught by Calvinism is absolutely contrary to Second Peter chapter three verse nine. And Second Peter chapter three verse nine is absolutely contrary to that false doctrine. Now, since God said that Gentiles would get in on the promises as well as the Jews, back in Romans chapter nine, God's purposes according to election stand for us by faith in Jesus Christ. That's how you get in. Romans chapter 9, we'll go back there and look at verse 24 through 26. Even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he saith in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Those are Gentiles who come to belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. Right there. And God's purpose according to election stands by faith in Jesus Christ. We get in as Gentiles because of the righteousness which is of faith in Romans 9.30. And those Jews who don't get in, don't get in because they sought it not by faith in Romans 9.32. That's what's going on in Romans 9. That's what's going on concerning the purpose of God and election. Now, there's some other specifics in this chapter that I want to give you that kind of help you with some of the wording. Romans 9.11. For the children being not yet born, this is speaking of um, Jacob and Esau, neither having done any good or evil that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. Neither Jacob nor Esau, listen, could have affected what God had already chosen for them. With God's foreknowledge, and you can't separate God from his foreknowledge, he already knows how things are going to turn out. With his foreknowledge that you read about in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, of what Esau and Jacob would do, he chose, God did, to continue the line of Christ and the promises through Jacob, not through Esau. Look at verses 14 through 16 in Romans chapter 9. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, see that word, nor of him that runneth, See that word? But of God that showeth mercy. The willing and the running are specific to the incident of the choice of, es of Jacob over Esau. Look, Esau and Isaac were the ones who willeth. Isaac wanted to bless Esau. And Esau wanted to kill Jacob and cut off his blessing. Neither of those happened. And Jacob is the one who runneth. After running away, he still made it back to the land that God had promised Abraham, though it took him about 20 years. You see, God had a purpose concerning those boys, and that purpose was fulfilled despite what they wanted to do and despite what they did. In Romans chapter 9, verse 19, the, the Bible says, Thou will say unto me, then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Uh, and then look at verse 19. Yeah, that one. And then, and then verse 20, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing form say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? God here is dealing with power over the clay, C-L-A-Y. That's what we're made out of. That's not our spirit or our soul. That's our body. God raised up Pharaoh in Romans 9, 17. The scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose, have I raised thee up that I might show my power in thee and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. In God's foreknowledge, he knew exactly how Pharaoh would handle the words of God that were preached by Moses and Aaron. He knew that Pharaoh would reject him. He knew that this Pharaoh was the right king who would give God every opportunity to use every one of those plagues and show his power in Egypt for the entire world to know. But I'm going to tell you something. 
though he, though he made that selection of Jacob and not Esau, though he made that selection of Pharaoh, God did not predestinate Esau to hell. And he did not predestinate Pharaoh to hell. God simply exercised his power over the clay. The decision whether to follow the Lord or not was still up to the individuals. Pharaoh chose to reject God. When Moses and Aaron presented uh, the, the, the um, admonition from God, that, that challenge from God about let my people go, he said, I know, Pharaoh said, I know not the Lord. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. He was an agnostic. Pharaoh chose to reject God, and Esau chose to sell his birthright in Genesis 25, verses 31 to 33. Hebrews uh, chapter 12 tells you all about the outcome of that. Those individual decisions of the heart were made by the men themselves and not by God. You see that? Therefore, election in Romans chapter 9 has nothing to do with Calvinism or with an individual being elected to salvation by God. God extends his mercy to any person who will put his faith in Jesus Christ apart from the works of the law. Romans 9, verses 30 to 33, Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you save through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, and so forth and so on. Now, with what you've heard today, we don't expect that you're going to be able to convince a friend who wants you to believe in his doctrine of Calvinism by showing him these verses. When a man has already made up his mind that he's right in his doctrine, he will argue until you see it his way or he will just turn you off. And that's too bad. However, we don't want to discourage you from trying to show him the truth. You know what our main prayer is? Our main prayer is that he doesn't poison you with his false doctrine. I pray this lesson on election today has been a help to you. It has to me. Amen. You have been listening to The Unknown Bible, the radio ministry of Bible Believers Baptist Church in Corpus Christi, Texas. For information about our church, go to our church website at www.my3bc.com. That's my, the number three, bc.com. If you would like to contact us by telephone, our number is 361-241-6100. Bible Believers Baptist Church is a Bible-believing church located at 1701 Rand Morgan Road. If you are not currently a member of a Bible-believing church and you are looking for a church with an uncompromising stand on the words of God, come visit with us this Sunday or Wednesday. We would love to see you. Hallelujah.